the story of Ramon Raquelo was in a list somewhere for a long time. And when we decided to discuss doing an exhibition uh, at Tabacalera and at the Ville de Vite in, in, in Rotterdam, um, I guess it, it was going to be the first sort of real monographic exhibition, sort of survey of, 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 of sorts. Um, and it seemed kind of, uh, it wasn't very tempting to just call it a you know monographic show or like Eric Baudelaire would. But it, I wanted to try to find a, an umbrella for the work, and I think in general in the practice for the past ten or fifteen years, there's always been a word or a set of words that have described a body of work. So it was the imagined states for for the first five years where I was photographing in Apasia, and then it became uh, work that was related to September 11th and the f aftermath of September 11th, and I, in my mind that work was called circumambulation. And then there was a, a, a cycle of work that began in, when I was in residency in Japan, and all of the work for four or five years sort of fell under this category, uh, this word uh, called the Anabasis. And it just seemed like the story of Raymond Raquello was very interesting because of the period of today, what's happening in the world today. It seemed like a very apt allegory to sort of park the rest of the, or choose work from the past 10 years under this broad narrative, which is sort of summarized in the vitrine, in the first vitrine when you enter. It's also summarized on the radio. Um, but there are many aspects in this story that I find interesting. First of all, this idea of a radio play that is meant to be theater, uh, that is meant to be uh, a piece of fiction that is broadcast on a, on a, in a very new medium, the radio, which uh, people don't necessarily have completely understood its power in, in 1938, or they have understood its power, but they perhaps have not completely understood how it functions relative to other media, such as newspapers. And it created this sensation where you know a number of people in New York and in the in the region thought that Martians were actually invading. Um, but it's a very complicated story, and it has many layers. I'm not going to talk about all of them here because they're in the vitrine. But also, the ones that are, that are important are to me are um, this idea that falsification, which today um, has become a very present subject matter, because it seems like we're entering into a, a, a period of our political history where um, the state's relationship to truthful narratives or the notion of factual, um, uh, factual expressions of, of uh, descriptions of situations is, is sort of fragmenting in, in, in very pervasive ways. So uh, it seems like in, in the current cycle, when a politician makes a lie, the only thing that can help him move forward is to make an even bigger lie and then an even bigger lie that chases the previous one. And I think we're at a point today where half of what comes out of the mouth of Donald Trump is false. And, and, and this, I think, has tremendous re implications. I mean, this, I think, is not a trivial uh, matter. I think it's, it's a fundamental sort of epistemological shift in, 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 in our world. And I wanted to sort of bring the story of Raymond Raquello here because I wanted to think about how the collapse or the blurring of the boundaries between fiction and reality was not always something that was detrimental to our political organization or, the, or, the, or our experience of political life. Um, I've frequently been interested in blurring the lines between fiction and, and, and reality, but always as a manner to underline something about the constructs that we live with, uh, such as statehood, um, or various uh, things that relate to representation. I invoke fiction as a way to make us think differently about reality, and I wanted to bring the story of Raymond Raquello as an early example of this, um, as a manner of thinking more generally about the relationship to fiction that we have in our political moment today. Sometimes people ask me, you know, why there's this recurrence of, the con of, of this notion of terrorism inside of the work. Why do I work around this topic? And it's funny because I think it's, honestly, it's, it's not a question I've ever asked myself. It's always seemed to be just evident. I think I make work about whatever is preoccupying me at the moment. And I think that, you know, one of the other important events that happened after, for me, 
in, in the process of becoming an artist after going to Abkhazia uh, in 2000 was, uh, you know, I went to Abkhazia in 2000 and then the summer after, Max came to New York. To, so August 2001, Max was in New York. And then September 2001 was the World Trade Center um, uh, with the 9-11 attacks. And, uh, and I think this for me is also sort of a fundamentally important moment because of because it indicates a very big shift in our life. It indicates a, uh, there's going to be a before and an after. And I think, you know, 15 years, 17 years later, 16 years later, we are, I think you can, every day you open the newspaper, you will probably find three or four things in the newspaper that simply would probably not have happened if 9-11 had not happened. So everything from yesterday, the, the bombing of the mosque in Mosul, uh, the destruction of a historic mosque in Mosul to, uh, uh, you know, the, the death of a French uh, journalist in Mosul to every single day things happen that are directly linked to this event um, in the, the, which happened in the United States. And I think that to some extent uh, I, had, I, I had sort of a feeling, a premonition of, that the, of the monumental importance of what was happening from the very early m m morning on, on, and, uh, on that day, I sort of had a feeling that there was, the rest of our lives was going to be defined by the responses and the reactions and the counter-reactions to what was happening then. And so I think this is simply why this recurrence of this idea of terrorism is, is present in the work, because it's not so much terrorism per se that interests me. I don't think it's particularly interesting. Um, what interests me is the manner in which our experience of the world is fundamentally altered by this thing that we call terrorism. And it's not even a word that I'm very comfortable using because it's a word that has been misused, transformed, manipulated, uh, you know, ad nauseum. So I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm, I'm preoccupied with terrorism. I think I'm preoccupied with the events of the world and the events of the world are frequently um, um, affected by sort of asymmetrical forms of violence, um, which we could call terrorism. But, you know, I was speaking to Catherine Perret, who's a, a French philosopher the other day, and she, she said something that I thought was very interesting. She said, essentially, since 9-11, and since the, the attacks in Paris on November 13th, she said, it's not terrorism, what we're dealing with. It's fait divers. How do you say fait divers? Um, like small crimes, or I, I, there's a better term for this, but essentially it's the idea that every attack that has happened in France or in most attacks that have happened in Europe since at least the November 13th attacks have been the actions of, um, you know, slightly uh, psychiatrically disturbed youths um, uh, who express their violence in a manner that is only marginally related to the larger political picture. Um, so I'm sort of getting sidetracked here, but I think the point is that from the early days of, of studying political science and working as a researcher in political science until today, my overall um, sort of, my brain just in the morning wakes up and, it, and, it, and it's interested in trying to understand what's happening and to try to find a form to translate my thinking about what's happening or to give it a form to, to be able to communicate it to somebody else. And I think so, you know, in, in the course of my life, I've thought I wanted to do all kinds of different things. I thought I wanted to be a journalist. I thought I wanted to be a documentarian. Um, now I'm doing this. But it's always really the same thing. It's just sort of, tr and, and before that, it was trying to, to, to conduct social scientific research to uh, convey uh, an understanding of a situation. And I've really only ever been doing the same thing. What's changed over time is that the problems that I encounter when I'm trying to find the forms uh, change. So, you know, when I was a photographer, I was trying to, to, to make a body of photographic work that would express what I was understanding of the problem of unrecognized states. But this is a really complicated thing to photograph because it's already difficult to photograph a state because a state's a concept. It's not, it's not a place, it's a concept. But photographing a concept that is not recognized is like a double layer of abstraction. And I spent five or six years trying to find a way to make an image, a still image, of a 
of a, of a concept wrapped in another concept, which is a really problematic, <laughs> I mean, it's a difficult problem to solve. So I think, you know, sometimes people ask me, why did I stop becoming a photographer? It's just simply that I just couldn't find a way out of this problem. And so going back to Abkhazia, and it doesn't mean that I, you know, don't recognize the earlier bodies of work. I have the, they're all, you know, things that, that I produce, so I have to, 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 to I, I, some of them, most of them I still like, but, um, this film here, Letters to Max, and the letters that are over there, and Max's presence here, these are just different um, attempts to find formal solutions for these, these discussions that I have with Max, or with, uh, with Dove, or with uh, of, of, of this, the complexity of the situation, and then just trying to find forms that, that reflect the complexity of these discussions and of these situations. So this is a super long way to get back to your question, which is why do I make this film also known as Jihadi? It's exactly the same thing. It's the, the, I'm in, I was in Korea working on a, a very strange film in collaboration with a Korean artist called uh, Hegyu Young, and I was working on a question that related to sort of Korean history. And there was this event in Paris on November 13th, and for some reason, even though it's not the first terrorist attack that has occurred, you know, in recent years, I think this one hit very close to home because the two of the places that were hit are places that I go to all the time. I have several friends that were affected by the, by the events, and it just sort of felt like here was a particularly complicated question that I had to try to find a form for. And so I came back to France and I, and I started working on the film. Um, and all the decisions made in the film are just decisions made because it seemed like they're just manner of investigating this question, which is, you know, why would a French, a young French man, what, 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 what is there to learn about this journey of, of young French men and women who leave France to go to Syria and, and to enroll with uh, the Islamic State. What is this about? How do you make a film about a subject like this? And so, with also known as jihadi, um, there is a number of things that I found to be important, and those were questioning the locations where somebody has lived and questioning the documents that the state produces to uh, judge somebody who has made the decisions that Aziz has made, for example. And so that became the subject matter of the, f that became the material from which we made the film. Not because, not in a way that would say, you know, we can understand Aziz because we see a picture of the house that he lived in. It's, it's different. It's asking the question of what should we be thinking about when we look at this house? And then that's, that's, that's really what the film is, is, is doing. So the, the film is called also known as Jihadi and because it's a remake of a, of a film from 1969 that was called AKA Serial Killer, which is a film by Masao Adachi and, and um, three or four other filmmakers who were working as a improvised collaborative um, in 1969. Um, 1969 was also a super politicized period in Japan and um, there was a, an event, there was a, a young man who killed four other people um, in the course of a week. He, he, he stole a gun from a military base and he shot people. And um, Masawa Dachi wanted to make a film about this situation. Um, and so they went to do a repérage, to do a um, location, location scouting. And they went to all the different places where this young man had lived, from the, the, the place where he was born in Hokkaido, Japan, to um, Osaka, where he had lived, to Tokyo, to Taiwan, where he had been on a trip. And I think they were just sort of filming locations to sort of figure out what kind of film they were going to make. And at some point, somebody, probably Masao Adachi, said, you know what, this is the film. The location scouting is the film because there's something about Japanese society and its rapid transformation after the war, um, this mad development, uh, urbanization. There must be something in these landscapes that teaches us something about what this young man experienced. And maybe this is a way to talk about his life, is just to film his, the landscapes that he lived in. And I find that this is a very interesting 
proposal. So it's a very structuralist, very materialist, Marxist approach to cinema. Um, and I was, for a long time, I've been interested in doing a remake because I think it's a very interesting cinematic proposition, but it's also problematic, right? Because uh, there's a risk that it's a very, that it could be conceived as a very deterministic, structuralist approach. You are what your environment makes you. So you become a serial killer because you grew up in these environments. So I, obviously, I'm, I wouldn't say that I adopt this landscape theory as a, um, as a sort of, you know, accurate method for uh, describing a life or, a, or, or the motives of, a, of, a, of an action. But I do think that thinking about the landscape theory is an interesting way to think about sort of social and political um, circumstances. So it's not necessarily saying because Aziz grew up in, in these buildings, you know, he had to emigrate and go to, to, uh, to leave and, and go and live in Syria. It's more, what can we think about when we're looking at these landscapes? And what does this tell us about uh, France, the way France has developed its urban periphery? Where did we place people who had come to rebuild France after the war? Um, and it, so it sort of opens up a bunch of questions, but it doesn't necessarily tell us that much about Aziz per se. So that's, you know, the, the one reason why the film is not called AKA Jihadi, but it's called also known as Jihadi, because I wanted to remind myself what AKA stands for because it's become such a word, AKA is like, um, you know, rappers use AKA, it's become something, but we, I wanted it to, to really emphasize what, these, what this means, which means also known as jihadi. So it's not a film about Aziz. It's a film about what Aziz is also known as. Um, so in a way, it's, 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 it's very different uh, than other films because it's, it, it pretends to be a film about something, but it isn't. It's not a film about Aziz, it's a film about what we collectively as a society have constructed as a concept, which is this notion of the jihadi. So the very, very first letter from June 29th was, was uh, I don't think you were, you didn't know about it would arrive because I didn't think it would arrive. So it was just, it was meant to be sort of like mail art. You know, I would, I would send a letter to Abkhazia, it would come back to my studio and the letter would say, you know, Max, are you there? But since the letter had not arrived, it would question whether or not Max is there and it was some sort of not particularly good mail art project that was that's all it was going to be it was just going to be a pile of letters that didn't get to max but when the letter did arrive to max it took 10 weeks and it was so surprising that uh, then the whole letter writing campaign continued um, it wasn't really premeditated but the 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 the, the um, sequence of the letters and the questions that are asked I think we're just like a summary of the questions that Max and I had talked about, or we had talked with Dove about for the past 10 years. And it was just sort of saying, how could we, instead of writing, you know, it could have been a book about like our discussions about Abkhazia, but instead it was just, let's recapitulate these themes that are always coming back. And, um, and then, you know, expecting Max to respond with, uh, by telling stories, because Max is a great storyteller. And then, but the, we didn't really know what, uh, I think I had an idea of what we might get to, but I never heard what Max was recording until six months or eight months later. In other words, Max was recording all the letters by himself, and then I came to Abkhazia a year later, with a camera, and we had an, I had an apartment in Sukhum, and we would see Max every day, and um, what I would do in the morning is I would listen to Max's answers, and then Sergei, who's the character in the middle of the film, who's a very good friend of ours, um, I would just go with Sergei to some place in Abkhazia, and I've known Sergei for also 17 years, so we've been to most of these places before. As a, when, I was was when I was working as a photographer, I would go to these similar places also with Sergei and with Max. So it was almost like we, this is why sometimes I talk about Abkhazia like the studio, because it's very familiar. And we would listen to Max's answer to something, and we would say, okay, well this would be good to go, we should go film this. 
uh, and maybe that'll work well. So like while listening to Max's answers, we would just make notes of uh, places and then we'd go film there. And then it was also the 20th anniversary of independence, no, of the end of the war. So there was these celebrations that were taking place and at the end of the month of September, there was gonna be this big parade. So I knew that that was gonna happen. So that was obviously something we would film because the, the parade for independence was a big thing. It's the 20th anniversary and so, so that was obvious material. But then the rest was just sort of decided upon um, in the editing. And going to Abkhazia and thinking about this idea of notion of identity and nationality and the relationship to, to um, uh, national identity is, is very interesting because the parameters are so different that it sort of forces you to think about your own questions uh, differently. And so in a way when Max says, you know, that, that maybe my questions make him think about things in, in different ways, it's certainly been the case for us as well. We think about things differently because of the experience of Abkhazia. Xavier is the official architect of the, uh, of traditionally has been the official architect of all the an embassies and all the exhibitions we've done with Maxime. So in, in Beton Salon in Paris, in Norway, in, um, in Sharjah, in the United Arab Emirates, in San Francisco, at the Cadiz Foundation, at the Berkeley Art Museum. The, the, the reason why it was interesting to work with, uh, with an architect is because, you know, an, an, uh, an embassy is, is about representation and it's about theatricality. And so it, it, it poses the question of the stage and of the set. And so bringing in Xavier as, a, as a, somebody to participate in this discussion allows us to think about things really interestingly. So this is the first time that the an embassy actually looks sort of like a real office. In its previous versions, the furniture was designed by Xavier in a very neutral manner. Um, and we wanted to try something different here, so we recycled uh, municipal furniture. Um, but we also discussed with Xavier how to do all of the exhibition here. And it, it was interesting because I think it's a beautiful space, it's an industrial space, but it's also a very difficult space for an artist, I think, to work in because it's very, it's big, but it's not completely monumental. But at the same time, it's not small. So. If you make works that are sort of in a certain size, like I do, I don't make giant sculptures. Um, it's complicated to, to, to show films and it's complicated to, sh to, to show works if you can't build you know, huge structures inside of this structure. So the, the problems that we tried to solve is how do you, uh, I think it's important when you are invited in an exhibit, to do an exhibition somewhere, that you try to provide the public who is used to seeing the space exhibition after exhibition. I always want to have the ambition to say like, what if the public comes and they don't recognize the space or they feel like the space has been altered in a significant way. And I think that's what we tried to do. We came here three times to look at the space. And then within the, the, the and you know, we made proposals to, with the colors and with the, 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 the setting up of the, the, the architecture, just to try to, to rival with the space, but also change it enough so that when people come here, it doesn't look like the tabacarera that they know every time they come here. Or to make, make it a slightly, think about the space differently. And so I think, you know, the paint was, was an important part of it, for example. But it's true that the word fake has a connotation um, that is, opposes it to real, and it's problematic. Because I don't think, I like the idea that we could call it fake news. One of the headlines in the newspaper that's in the vitrine says, fake radio show panics nation. So this idea of fake was already kind of present there. Um, I do think you're right that there's a progressive sort of evolution in, in our relationship to real and unreal forms of sort of narrative and that certainly the advent of reality TV, you know, thank you on uh, is is a, uh, is probably a, land, a, a landmark event because I do think that it is the first massive stage of habituation to this idea of blurring the lines completely as entertainment in a documentary form where the people themselves are not even clear whether what they are doing is real or fiction. <laughs> I think even the, the events of their lives are modified by this paradigm. So I think it's a sea change, you're right. Uh, the fact that it generates money means that this has, it's like weaponized, it becomes extremely uh, uh, powerful inside of the culture. So I think you're right. Um, 
I haven't read the book by Bernard-Henri Lévy, but for me a book that would be similarly important was Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, because, and I think it's perhaps a, a seminal text in that sense, it's an investigation that decides to apply the craftsmanship of fiction writing, not as a service to, you know, making it more entertaining, no, in the service of um, providing us with a deeper experience of something that is actually factual. And I've always been really inspired by these kinds of books. You know, another book that's been tremendously important for me is Libra by Don DeLillo, which was, spoke, was very relevant for me because at the time, I was sort of, when I was a political scientist, I was specialized in the Cuban Missile Crisis. That was my area of expertise. And so I, there's not a single detail of the Cuban Missile Crisis that I did not study. But when I read the book, Don DeLillo's book, which is fictional account of the assassination of Kennedy, it opened up these enormous doors for me of saying, of understanding things that I don't think any of the archives I had read would enable me to think about things in that way. So the power of fiction and falsification is something that I find is very interesting and something that, you know, Gilles Deleuze wrote about very interestingly. Um, but you're right, now we're at a very different time. I mean, this morning in the New York Times, there's an article that is literally called Every Single Lie Stated Publicly by Donald Trump Since His Inauguration. And it's a list. It's a catalog. And he's saying, it, and in the New York Times, which is the, the newspaper of reference, the, the institution that tries, and it has not always succeeded, but it tries to be the arbiter of what is true and what is fake. And, you know, four months into a presidency, they're running an article saying, this is the list of all the falsehoods that are being said, and that probably 90% of Donald Trump's voting base believes to be true.